so glad we have so many people interested in foreign policy and in Cuba today. Um, I've been covering this beat for over a decade, and I have to say, usually, um, you know, stories about diplomacy can be very slow and takes time. You don't have really dramatic changes, but the U.S.-Cuba story has been the first one on my beat that's been a very dramatic change. It's been very fun to cover. Um, you know, usually you have diplomats coming together, and if they agree to meet again, that's a story. Here in the, the U.S.-Cuba thing, it's a dramatic change. Um, and there's quite a backstory to these talks. There were secret negotiations going on with the Vatican and the Canadian government involved. There was a prisoner exchange, and there was even a secret pregnancy. That is, that the U.S. government helped uh, a convicted Cuban spy in the United States impregnate his wife back in Havana so that when he went home during this whole prisoner exchange, he was welcomed back, given a hero's welcome and a new baby. So <laughs> very, very fr infrequently do I get a story like that. Um, the, you know, the Obama administration announced this thaw back in December. Uh, the president said the policy, which was frozen for 50 years, needed an upgrade. Um, but, you know, is this policy working? Are these changes benefiting people in Cuba yet? These are some of the questions that I'm going to put to the panelists here, and we're going to get to your questions as well. Um, on my right, we have uh, William Leo Grand. He's the a professor at American University. He's written numerous books, including his most recent called Back Channel to Cuba, the Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. We also have Mauricio Clever Caron, who's co-founder of the U.S.-Cuba Democracy Pact. He's a keen follower of the politics on Capitol Hill, and he writes um, a very great blog. You should sign up for it to get the latest yeah. news um, from that perspective. And I want to start with Professor Leo Grand. Um, because he's documented these negotiations, um, I'm wondering how unusual you think the Obama administration's approach was. Uh, the Obama administration didn't go to the State Department. It had two uh, very young officials in the White House going to these secret talks. Um, how unusual was that, and do you think it worked? Uh, it's not actually the, um, the secrecy of the Obama talks is not as unusual as you might expect. Every president since Eisenhower negotiated with Cuba about one thing or another, and almost always those negotiations were done in secret. Now, often they did involve diplomats from the Department of State, but it's, it was quite common to have only a handful of people in the United States government know that negotiations were going on because of the political sensitivity of it. Um, and in fact, back in 1995, when we negotiated a migration accord with Cuba, uh, the State Department, uh, except for two people, uh, was kept in the dark during that negotiation as well. Um, so this time, for those of you who don't know, two national uh, security staff people, uh, Ben Rhodes and Ricardo Zuniga, were the U.S. team. The Cuban team, interestingly, was just as narrow. It was only a handful of people from uh, uh, President Castro's office. And they reached an agreement uh, for exchanging of prisoners, uh, for a number of, of other issues in terms of the United States relaxing travel uh, and some uh, uh, commercial uh, licenses on Cuba, and of course to ultimately normalize diplomatic relations, which they did uh, on July 20 of this year. The, uh, as part of the deal, originally, the Cubans um, allowed a lot of political prisoners out of um, jail, but ha did the Cubans do enough? Did the U.S. get enough out of this opening, do you yeah. think, Mauricio? Well, the, the Cuban regime has long used political prisoners as tools of negotiation. Uh, during the Carter years, they released uh, over a thousand at one given time. Uh, then obviously when popes have traveled to Cuba, they've also uh, released. But it's a revolving door. As soon as those prisoners get released, they go and they arrest a whole new batch and then use them as uh, tools of negotiation. Um, one of the big concerns about the whole premise of these talks is that the talks began, they stemmed from the taking of an American hostage. I mean, let's not forget this. You know, Alan Gross, who was an American development worker who had gone to Cuba in order to help the Cuban people uh, with internet technology in order to circumvent uh, the censorship of the regime in that regards, was taken hostage. And the Cuban regime was not shy about saying what the conditions for this hostage's release were. 
And the conditions for these hostages release was essentially a trade for a group of Cuban spies, one of whom was serving a life sentence here in the United States in federal prison for the murder, for conspiracy in the murder of three Americans and a permanent resident of the United States. And those were the individuals that ultimately were released in an exchange. They say it wasn't really an exchange per se, and they, you know, but let's, we can put the rhetoric aside. It was essentially an exchange. Um, and in this deal, part of the, also what was talked about was the release of, of, of 53 political prisoners. Now, what's interesting is that the announcement was made December 17th, 2014. A lot of those political prisoners had been released, a couple of them had been released over a year before. Um, so I think this was a lot of cushioning uh, in order to make it sound like somehow we got something out of this deal with the Cuban regime, but frankly, we didn't get much out of it. I will also add that since the December 17th deal, over half of those 53 have been rearrested at some point. Um, it, then they've been released and rearrested, et cetera. That there's been a whole batch of new political prisoners. Uh, one was just actually now, one was actually arrested on Christmas Day. So the announcement was December 17th. On December 25th, a very young, talented artist called Danilo Maldonado, known as El Sexto, he's a graffiti artist, was arrested for essentially, he did a, a, a performance. And his performance was there was two pigs and he drew the name Raul and Fidel on the pigs. <laughs> well, for that, they put him in prison. And he spent in a, in a, in a, in a very, uh, very nasty prison, a very infamous prison uh, in Cuba, or Valle Grande. He spent 10 months, uh, and it wasn't until now, fortunately, uh, after weeks, 25 straight weeks of C Cuban dissidents, courageous activists led by the ladies in white who were the wives, uh, sisters, mothers of Cuban political prisoners. Every week they're going out there and demanding his release, getting beaten up, getting arrested, and then finally groups like Amnesty International uh, last month coming in and intervening that he was finally released. But there's others like him that have been arrested since then. In January, another famous rapper uh, called El Decano uh, was in prison, given a, a year sentence. I can talk forever, so I'm gonna get <laughs> sh shut up because I can ramble. But the bottom line is, in this regards, uh, even the 53 political prisoners, which was supposedly one of the things that we got in regards to this deal um, uh, for everything that the United States has given, uh, even that is quite questionable, uh, and we're seeing that that's uh, really a revolving door. I'll, I'll ask you to follow up on that in a few minutes, but first, um, this week the UN General Assembly did its annual vote against the, the Cuban embargo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's always, every year it's a lopsided vote. I think only the U.S. and Israel voted against it. Um, the rest of the world um, voted to demand that the U.S. lift this embargo. Um, the, the Obama administration sort of held out the possibility that they might abstain this year if the Cubans rewrote it a little bit. Right. The Cubans didn't rewrite it. Um, and I wonder if you get the sense that, you know, the, the administration is sort of hoping for something different that it's not getting from, from Cuba. I, and I also, uh, you know, I also remember this at the um, UN General Assembly when Raul Castro g gave a speech. It was his first time coming here. And his speech was sort of the same old, same old rhetoric. And a US official came up to me afterwards and said, well, I guess it's because he knew that Fidel was watching him back in Havana. <laughs> so, I mean, is that the sense that it, as long as Fidel Castro is around, y the expectations have to be low, or do you think the U.S. is no, you know, I, no, I don't think too it, much? No, I, I don't think it has to do with Fidel Castro. I think it's pretty clear that he really is retired from politics. I think that the reason that Raul's speech at the United Nations was a fairly tough speech, I mean, if you read President Obama's speech, his speech was about uh, the, uh, the importance of using diplomacy instead of force. That was the theme of his speech. And he held out Cuba as an example of, of a successful use of diplomacy instead of force. So for the president, it was, you know, the, on the Cuba issue, glass half full. And President Castro got up and said, no, 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 glass half empty, and talked about all the issues still that need to be resolved. And there are, of course, a, a long list of issues still to be resolved between the two countries. On the UN vote on uh, the Cuban resolution calling for the end of the embargo, I think it's a very similar kind of thing. So why wasn't Cuba willing to, to modify the resolution? I think that uh, the Cubans believe, rightly, that it was partly international pressure, especially from Latin America, that contributed to Obama's decision to change the policy. And I think they don't want to see that pressure let up or want the international community to think that somehow everything is fine now 
when the top item on their agenda, which is lifting U.S. economic sanctions, hasn't been achieved. And so for them, it, every time Raul Castro gives a speech, the two things he talks about is essential to the full normalization of relations are lifting of the embargo and the return of Guantanamo Naval Station. Uh, and until those things are done, I think the Cubans are going to be reluctant to uh, have too much progress in resolving all the other issues for fear that at the end of the day, the United States will say, well, we've resolved the issues important to us and we're done. But one of the things the Obama administration argued is that changing its approach to Cuba would be important to get the rest of the continent on board to agree and to, to take that thorn out of the relationship with the rest of the continent. Um, do you see any other country coming up and saying, okay, you know, don't stop blaming the U.S. for all your problems, you need to deal with some of your own problems. So I, so I think that strategy, which is especially aimed at Latin America, has actually shown some success. The uh, Summit of the Americas that was held in uh, Panama last April was very successful from the U.S. point of view. The United States got a lot of kudos for having changed the policy towards Cuba, and we were able to engage with Latin Americans on a whole series of other issues that are important to us, immigration, narcotics control, and so on and so forth. Whereas in the prior summit in Cartagena, Colombia in 2012, the issue of Cuba had dominated the agenda and actually prevented us from making much progress. In several of the speeches given by senior officials, including the president himself, they've talked about how this change in Cuba policy opens an opportunity for the United States to assume a new leadership role in the hemisphere. And I think, in fact, that that's been successful. How much quiet diplomacy other Latin American countries do with Cuba on issues like democracy and human rights is something we'll have to wait and see. And it'll be hard to detect because it will be quiet diplomacy. We're not going to see uh, many, or if any, Latin American countries out there publicly criticizing Cuba for these practices. I, I want to turn to you on that as well because the, yeah. there's a lot of concern about uh, Venezuela, for instance. Yeah, I, I mean, so you know, Ben Franklin famously said, you know, that there's there's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing worse than seeing a beautiful theory being beaten up by a gang of brutal facts, and uh, <laughs> and 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 in fact, um, you know, the theory was and 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 kind of the. the the way that Professor took it was, oh, well, we were taking Cuba out of the table to discuss other issues with Latin America. But no, what was said and what has been testified in Congress by Obama administration officials is that this new policy was going to help us bring other countries in the region to help us advocate for democracy and for greater human rights in Cuba. We have seen zero of that. To the contrary, there has been a shower of foreign dignitaries, of, of a pope, of members of Congress, of others that have traveled to the island, and, and un, in an unprecedented fashion, more than ever, we're seeing them completely discard the issue of democracy, the issue of human rights, uh, putting those on the table. To the contrary, democracy activists are being relegated, they're not being talked about, and my God, for the first time in history, uh, Raul Castro was on Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. I mean, here was a dictator who was bankrupt, broke, uh, somewhat irrelevant, and now we've catapulted him into one of these influential people, and he goes to the Vatican, and it's a media thing, and now they just announced he's going on a state visit to Mexico. Uh, so we've actually turned this irrelevant bankrupt dictator into an international personality uh, with this deal. Now, whether it's going to work uh, somehow by us engaging uh, uh, Cuba and saying Raul Castro is okay that other countries are gonna point out some of his realities. Well look at Venezuela. What other countries in the region are actively advocating uh, uh, against uh, what the, the violence and against the, 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 the lack of democracy and, and the breakup of the ins uh, democratic institutions that we're seeing in Venezuela? None of them. You know, I was, uh, there's, I mean, a, there's a joke with Latin America. There's accurate. a joke with Latin America that it's always ex-Latin American presidents are always very brave. There's been ex-Latin American presidents that go on and have been out there advocating for democracy in, in Venezuela and against uh, the, the, um, the assault on democratic institutions in Venezuela. But yet, none of the presidents that are in power have been doing anything in that regards. And, 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 the, Demo and, and, and the democratic opposition in Venezuela is begging them to do so. And yet we're not seeing it. And yet we expect in the case of Cuba we're going to do so. And I'll just mention one more fact so, so, so he can counter. Uh, in, the, in, in the UN, you know, the day after the UN condemned the United States uh, for its bilateral sanctions uh, towards Cuba, by almost the same numbers, they named Venezuela and Togo and some of the worst human rights violators in the world to the UN Human Rights Council.
Uh, so we're, that's, that, that, that there's a dichotomy here, and there's a double standard uh, that unfortunately is not addressed. So we're, we're talking about Cuba rather than Venezuela, but I do have to say that it really is not... But Cuba controls Venezuela. It's, not, it's, not, fair, it's not fair to say that no country in Latin America has, has tried to resolve the political crisis in Venezuela. The Mercosur countries uh, of the southern cone have worked for, for months and months, not very successfully, but have tried very hard to find uh, a peaceful solution to, to the deepening crisis in Venezuela. So, so to, to imply that somehow Latin America has turned its back on, on that crisis, I think is really, is really not fair. Can I ask you um, one of the other things about this new relationship is we both yeah. have, we have um, embassies in both uh, countries now. Mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. has said that it wants to, that will open its, the way to talk to more people and to mm -hmm. engage more Cubans. But I was at the opening of the embassy and they were very cautious not to invite, you know, the high profile dissidents. They wanted this to be very, you know, government to government, very formal. Right. But do you get the sense that the embassy is going to be doing more of that, reaching out to civil society, reaching out to dissidents. So I, th I, think, I think there's no question, because in the afternoon, after the flag raising ceremony at the embassy, they held a reception at the ambassador's residence in which many of those dissidents, right. as we well as other representatives of civil society, were invited. Um, the important thing in, in, in though, in, in, on that issue about having an embassy rather than just interest sections is that now U.S. diplomats are free to travel around Cuba okay. and speak with people as they please. They do have to give notice in advance to the foreign ministry that they're going to do that, and Cuban diplomats here must do the same. They must give notice before they travel outside the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. But previously, the diplomats were um, required to remain within uh, those, those two capital regions. And Havana is not Cuba. Cuba is much broader and outside Havana is much different than the capital city. And so for U.S. diplomats to be able to get out, travel around, and talk to people, not just to dissidents, but to ordinary people around the island, is very important in terms of improving the quality of political and economic reporting that comes out of the embassy. And, and that, in fact, the U.S. insistence on the right to be able to travel in that regard was the thing that hung up the final agreement on opening diplomatic relations for almost six months. Right, right. Um, Can I answer that? Because I think there's, there's a couple things that, that are incorrect there, frankly. We'll keep this civil, yeah. No, yeah, but no, I say incorrect. <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say incorrect in a bad way. I just think it was just incorrect. So, so yes, in, indeed. So there's, there's uh, of the, there's 51 U.S. diplomats at our embassy in, in Havana, of which 44 are able to travel freely throughout the country. The other 47 have to give notice. Uh, it, has yet, it yet remains to be seen what notice means and how it's going to be applied, and we don't quite, and we're not quite sure of that yet. But however, we will note that even that notice is something that's unprecedented in this Western Hemisphere. So we've negotiated a deal that's not only less than Vienna Convention standards, but is one that we don't allow for any country, including Venezuela, I hate to bring it up again, but uh, including Venezuela in the Western Hemisphere. So we've lowered our standards in order to make this deal hemispherically in that regards. So I think that that's an issue. And what really actually, uh, 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 one of the big issues that also hung up uh, uh, the, the, the final deal, although it was a bad one and, and lesser standards, was the fact that also the, the Cuban regime wanted to maintain a security cordon outside of the embassy in order to, for them uh, to vet who comes in and who doesn't. And, and they came to somewhat of an agreement in that regards. But also no agreement was reached on the diplomatic pouches, which also is lower than our Vienna Convention standards uh, because the Cubans don't want us to be able to bring in things freely into our embassy down there. So I just wanted to correct a couple so of those we, facts. We know exactly what notification means because this agreement restores the status quo ante before 2003 when U.S. and Cuban diplomats gave notice, not asked for permission, but gave notice before they traveled around the country. And that had worked for the better part of two decades. It's, um, and it, it does happen in other, in places, in repressive countries. Not in the like Western Hemisphere. Not in the Western Hemisphere, but in Russia, China, and places like that where there are restrictions on diplomats and what they can do. And I remember someone here telling me privately that they couldn't understand why they would give them a hard time when they, you know, we know you're going to follow us around anyway, so here you can <laughs> see where we're going. <laughs> so, but they, but diplomats do work in those kind of repressive situations in other, in other hemispheres, in other parts of the world.
Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what the Obama administration has done technically, you know, how easy is it for Americans to travel there now? Um, they also eased a lot of the trade restrictions, but don't you have, doesn't, don't the Cubans then have to do things on yes. their end to actually, you know, have a trade relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So the president uh, on, the, on the trade side has done a couple of things with two packages of licensing reforms, one in January of this year, one in September. Um, he licensed U.S. telecommunication companies to do business with Cuban state enterprises that run telecommunications to try to help expand the digital infrastructure on the island. Um, he <clears throat> uh, licensed U.S. businesses to trade with Cuban private businesses, and that would be uh, small private farmers on the one hand or uh, private urban entrepreneurs on the other hand. Um, but for those things to be implemented, obviously the Cuban government and the telecommunications front, the Cuban government has to be willing to do business in telecommunications with U.S. providers. I think there's been one small contract signed, but I don't get the impression that Cuba is particularly interested in U.S. telecommunications companies building its digital infrastructure. Um, they have counter offers from China, and my guess is they'll go with China. On the small business front, the small business sector in Cuba is very small and not capital intensive, and so for the moment, that kind of opening of trade is not all that significant. But it could be down the road because the uh, Cuban private sector is probably the fastest growing sector of the Cuban economy today. Um, but it will require, again, Cuban businesses to be able to get import-export licenses and, and exchange their Cuban currency for, for uh, dollars to trade with the United States. And the Cuban state doesn't have an apparatus. It doesn't have agencies that handle that. So there are a lot of logistical and technical things that have to happen before some of the openings that the president has made on the licensing front can actually begin to produce any significant trade. On the travel, the one thing the president did that was probably most important on travel was he gave a general license to travel providers for people-to-people -people educational travel to Cuba. Previously, if you wanted to provide a trip, you had to get a specific license from the Treasury Department, which involves a fairly complicated legal process. You had to hire a lawyer, you had to do a, an application, you had to wait sometimes six months for it to be approved, and so on and so on. With a general license now, there's a presumption that organizations that organize educational travel are uh, legitimate and can, can do it. They have to keep records, and so they can be audited. Uh, but it means that lots more travel providers can get into the market. And I'm sure in this audience you are getting lots of things in the mail from your alumni associations, from National Geographic, from classic tours, offering people-to-people -people educational <coughs> tours to Cuba. Is there a way to, to um, if more Americans are going there, more American businesses are dipping their toes in this area, to encourage change on the island, to, I mean, you know, it's supposed to be to help small businesses or private enterprises, but there's not much of that. Yeah. Um, is there a way to, to do that in a smart way? Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost, in regards, and I think you know, a couple of these sectors are very interesting and, and give good examples uh, to, to, to what your question is. You, know, you take the telecom sector, for instance, and it gets a lot of uh, news now and everything. But since 1992 in the Cuban Democracy Act, telecom has been exempted uh, from sanctions and, and certain transactions. Uh, a lot of people here will be shocked and surprised that the first internet connection that Cuba had was in 1996, and it was actually Sprint that made that connection uh, for them. Uh, the, the monopoly, the telecom monopoly in Cuba, which is, which is called okay. no, oh. the, the, the monopoly in Cuba, the telecom monopoly, which is a DEXA, which is the Castro regime owned telecom monopoly, uh, at, for, for, for a time, uh, about 30% of telecom uh, of, um, of a DEXA was owned by uh, an, the Italian telecom company, uh, STET. Um, yet, despite the fact that in 1996 we Sprint laid this internet connection, the, the, despite the fact uh, that Telecom Italia, uh, to a degree, um, was part owner, a large chunk of Edexa, we never saw any greater freedom in connectivity. We never saw any greater freedom for the Cuban people to enjoy uh, uh, the benefits of that. So that fact will show you that today it's not going to be any difference because the one thing and the greatest impediment here is that the Cuban regime insists 
on maintaining its monopolies. Now, there could be a theory out there that you know, if we can you know, just overload them with interest and with, with the possibility of investment, that somehow they're going to crack and they're going to have to allow certain openings. Um, I always joke that if that were the case, we don't need antitrust laws. We should have just done more business with monopolies and somehow they're going to fall apart. Or we don't need RICO laws. We should just do more business with the mafia and somehow they're just going to fall apart from all the business and all the interest. Uh, that's just not going to happen. To the contrary, monopolies are very good at controlling things and, and that's, that's the whole purpose of it. To see how it would happen and what the result would be, look, in 2000, this argument was also made in regards to you know, this, the sale of food, medicine, and me medical devices. A lot of people said, oh, the sanctions are, are hurting the Cuban people uh, because we're, they're denying them medicines and they're denying them food. Fantastic. So there was in 2000, there was an exemption made, albeit for cash, uh, for food, medicine, and medical devices, which is then, that's actually was ha what has, has been the legal basis for some of what the president has done now with the private sector, quote unquote, private sector in Cuba stuff. And yet, what has the result of that been? So since 2000, the United States has sold nearly $5 billion worth of agricultural products to Cuba. Over 250 entities here in the United States have done so. How many Cuban counterparts have there been for all of that business? One. One company <coughs> called Alamport. So every single penny of those $5 billion transacted by 250 American companies has been transacted with one client in Cuba. So that's your Cuban market right there. One company called Alamport. Uh, that's the concern. When people ask me, hey, what would happen if we, if we lift sanctions further? Are the Cuban people going to benefit, etc.? I don't think we have to theorize, going back to Ben Franklin. We've seen it. We've seen it with the Europeans. We've seen it with the Canadians. We've seen it with telecom for the last 25 years since the exemption in the Cuban Democracy Act. And we've seen it with ag, medicine, and medical devices since 2000 and the Trade Sanctions Reform Act. It gets funneled through a monopoly owned by the regime. That's not going to change, unfortunately. If it were to change, and I truly believe that, my God, I would be the first one sitting up here and say, let's do it. Uh, but that's unfortunately not the case. But you know, one of the interesting things that's going on right now, though, is that the Cuban economy is changing because of domestic dynamics. It's not the economy of 20 years ago, which was uh, based around a hyper-centralized Soviet model of economic planning that the Cubans adopted in the 1970s. Since, 19, or since 2011, Raul Castro has been trying to reorganize the Cuban economy around a more open kind of a socialist model on, on the idea of China or Vietnam. And uh, that is not insignificant. And the opening of the Cuban economy to the outside world changes the economic dynamic on the island. It changes the social dynamic. And I think in the long run, it also changes the political dynamic. So the United States can sit on the sideline and watch this process unfold, or it can engage in it and try to uh, be helpful in terms of, of moving it in a positive direction. We, we, uh, I want to get to questions, so there's a microphone right in here if you want to line up. And while you're lining up, I just want two, two second answers. Like, does Congress, <laughs> before Obama leaves office, does Congress do anything to lift fully lift the embargo or the travel no, ban? No, no, absolutely not. With Republicans in control of both houses, a presidential election underway, and the Republicans having a narrative the president is soft on foreign policy, there's no chance they're going to do anything to make Obama look good on the Cuba policy. I am happy to say I agree with the professor. <laughs> Maybe found, the only I, time today I found we'll the one place yeah. where we can agree. I'm going to okay. take it. <laughs> Please. Bernice Wallman from uh, Connecticut. Um, in in decades past, I, could, I had no trouble understanding the rationale that said um, Russia, our threatening uh, enemy, uh, should not um, have influence so close to our shores. Um, we have to be very strict about how we treat um, this, this potentially dangerous outpost of our enemy communism. Um, I'm having trouble understanding the rationale in recent years since, since the fall of the Soviet empire and the disappearance of um, Soviet influence in Cuba. Um, I have trouble understanding the rationale for why the human rights violations, which I don't question, um, and the economic policies that are unlike ours, which I don't question, um, why do we need to treat them any differently than we treat the many other places around the world with far more severe human rights violations and so forth. 
So, I, I, and I kind of alluded to this before, and I insisted, and I might have sounded weird, but I insisted the Western Hemisphere, because I think that's very important. You know, politics, you know, geopolitics is, is, is regional, and it should be from a regional perspective. A lot of people are advocating for, why don't we have a China model or a Vietnam model here in Cuba? Well, frankly, or a Burma model now. But a China, Vietnam, Burma model does not belong in the Western Hemisphere. We have, for the first time in our history, you know, in, two, in 2001, 34 out of 35 countries were democracies. Now, that's actually, we're now reverting a lot of that in Venezuela, thanks to a lot of the Cuban influence there. But I, I strongly believe that that has to be the standard or should be the standard. Uh, and if not, we missed out on opportunity. If what we're advocating for now is you know, this whole state capitalism model uh, in China, Vietnam, which I guess 50 years ago used to be called fascism, you know, we've had that you know, here in the Western Hemisphere. It was called Pinochet. It was called the Argentina Junta, et cetera. If that's what you want to have in Cuba now, essentially just a, a communist dictatorship by name, but really just a fascist dictatorship, we're going backwards. You know, what, where therefore we should just have very clear standards, which is what's codified in law, of what should be certain political freedoms that the Cuban people should have. And also in regards to uh, the threat and everything, I'm not, I'm not gonna say a threat, but in regards to the anti-American activities and, and the dangerous activities of, 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 of Cuba still today, look, Venezuela, uh, Moises Naim, who is no you know, ideologue one way or another, uh, 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 editor of foreign policy, said you know, the most under spoken story of the 21st century has been the Cuban control of Venezuela. Here is a bankrupt dictatorship that has essentially taken control over the most rich natural resource country in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that is a danger. Today, the fact that during our normalization talks with the Cuban government, uh, you essentially had these Russian intelligence ships being docked in, in Havana, that is an act of bad faith. Uh, you know, so, so it's not that this regime is, is, is in any way wanting uh, uh, to, to, they're not closet Democrats, that because we all of a sudden uh, say, hey, you know, we want to just do business with you, that they're going to come out of the closet and say, hey, you know what, I'm sorry for all those people we've killed and tortured and in prison and all the bad things we've done. We're just going to move down a different direction. I think it's a precedent that needs to be set, uh, uh, frankly, for, it, for, for, for regional perspectives. So, so I think the underlying premise of people who've argued against the president's policy is if we'd only maintain this policy of economic denial and isolation, eventually Cuba would become a democracy. Well, we tried for 54 years to get that result with no success whatsoever. We didn't make the situation in Cuba any better. We didn't improve the human rights situation in Cuba. We've got an economic embargo that retards economic growth in Cuba and thereby hurts ordinary people. Uh, which is why the last three popes have come out against uh, the embargo. I think the president came to the conclusion exactly that the questioner came to. Why, why are we doing this? Why don't we have a policy of, of engagement more like the policy that we have with other regimes? The recreation of diplomatic relations is, as Roberta Jacobson, Assistant Secretary for Latin America said, not a good housekeeping seal of approval. It's something that you do so that you can have a normal diplomatic exchange with countries and engage with them on issues where you have common interests and talk with them about issues that you have in disagreement and try to make progress on them. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. This is excellent. Um, Mauricio, uh, your comments about the double standard uh, for dictators reminds me of something Robbie George, uh, professor at Princeton, says, which is that according to our press, a murderous right-wing dictator is a murderous dictator. A murderous left-wing dictator is just a liberal in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> and, but my question is, Raul Castro, what's after him? Is there someone else waiting in the wings? Uh, is there, do they need to form something new? Do they need to find somebody? What, what happens because he's not going to live forever? I think uh, that's such a great question. And, and, and by the way, going back to the other thing, I don't understand why people continue to refer to Castro as President Castro, but yet still to this day it's dictator Pinochet. I, I, they're both dictators, they're both evil people, and, that, and we should have that, that same standard in this Western Hemisphere. But that's the key to this whole thing. The fact that we had secret negotiations now with the Obama administration in, in Ottawa and Toronto and in Rome, and that essentially the key figure in the Cuban side was Alejandro Castro, which is 
Raul Castro's son, uh, which is essentially the new generation. Uh, and, and Raul Castro has been very smart at how he places his kids, unlike Fidel, because uh, Fidel thinks that after him the world you know, ends. But, but Raul has been very smart in this regard. And he essentially has taken the three strands of government and put them under his kids' control, be it the economic side, uh, the, the conglomerate that was created in the 1990s called Gaesa, which controls almost 80% of the Cuban economy in the Cuban military, is run by his son-in-law called General Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Callejas. All of the foreign commerce, all of the investment, when we hear about the Morel port, et cetera, that's owned by Gaesa. I mean, those are all partnerships that are with the Cuban military. Uh, Alejandro is in the Ministry of the Interior. And at the end of the day, he is Raul's shadow in the Ministry of the Interior, which is what controls the intelligence apparatus, the security apparatus, and things of the sort. And then Mariela Castro is kind of the PR uh, face of, of the regime internationally and has been successful at, frankly, just giving it a soft image, uh, uh, per se. But, but Alejandro being a key person in these negotiations, I think is going backwards, and I think is my biggest concern, because what no one here is talking about is, is so yeah, it's great to have these conversations, the US versus Cuba, but the conversation that needs to take place is between the Cuban people and the Cuban regime. And at the end of the day, they're the ones that are being left out of the equation, because they're the ones that are being denied the opportunity to decide what their fate is and what their future is. And at the end of the day, what our policy seeks is for them to be able to decide who their leaders are going to be. And if we now essentially acquiesce that Alejandro Castro and that new generation of Raul's kids are the future, well, look, these guys, if you think that Alejandro is any different than Raul, you know, I, I recommend you go read his book and things of the sort. Uh, this guy is like a mini Latin American Putin. Uh, and if that's what we want to have, and if that's what we're going to bet on, just like we did bet on Putin uh, in the 1990s uh, in Russia, and that, and that turned out great, uh, then, then, we're, then you know, we're, we're, going, we're going in the wrong direction. We're empowering the wrong people politically by dealing with Alejandro, economically by allowing, uh, wanting uh, to open up and lift sanctions to, for it to be funneled through these entities that Gaesa has. We're essentially doing all the opposite things that could be happening right now. And what the difference is, and people will say, oh, is it a failed policy versus a failed policy or, or a successful policy? I think it's very simple. What was the Cuban regime in December of 2014? It was a politically, socially, and economically bankrupt regime. And now it's the hottest ticket in town. Everyone wants to talk about it. Look, this is the most popular panel uh, here, here that, there, that there is here today, which I'm glad, by the way, because you get you know, to learn other things about it. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but it's now the hottest ticket in town, uh, but not necessarily for all the good reasons. And, 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 and that's our concern. And, and I think it's a step in the, the president said it himself on the December 17th speech. He said, you know, essentially his concern, he said uh, um, a collapse of the Cuban government is not necessarily in our interest. I mean, I think we're going to have a debate on that. I think, frankly, it's not a bad thing. So, so can so you empower Alejandro, other people? So, I mean, Alejandro Castro is not in the line of succession. There is a constitutional first vice president. His name is Miguel Diaz Canel. Uh, he's a career bureaucrat. Um, he is a, a generation younger. And I think what we're already seeing in Cuba now is the, uh, the historic generation, that is to say the people who fought against Batista and overthrew the Batista <coughs> regime, are handing power over gradually at middle and now upper levels to a younger generation of people. So there's an institutional succession process going on. And you know, we used to always think, some people used to always think that, well, you know, when Fidel Castro passes from the scene, this regime's built around him and it's gonna collapse. Uh, well, it didn't. There was a fairly smooth transition to Raul. And so then, you know, the argument was, well, when Raul passes from the sea, then, then the regime's going to collapse. Well, there is a, an institutionalized process, whether we like it or not, in the government. It's not a government on the verge of collapse. It's not a government that was going to go bankrupt if Obama had, had not sort of pulled the rug out from under that. Uh, I mean, every... The supporters of uh, uh, the policy of hostility have been arguing since 1959 that collapse of the regime is just around the corner and we just have to press a little bit harder. Uh, and, you know, Obama's policy has been in place now for 12 months. In 50 years, if it hasn't worked, we can come back and talk about whether we ought to change. <laughs> you give him 50 years. <laughs> Next question. Uh, the best treatise on the negotiations was an art or description of it was an article in Mother Jones a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. I, I recommend it to you if you want to find out how we negotiated this. I actually wrote it. As you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific article. <laughs> Terrific article. <laughs> Mauricio, I feel your pain. In 1903, <laughs> my grandfather, Mauricio, moved to Havana out of New York. He was an American citizen. My grandmother and my grandfather built businesses in Cuba between 1903 in 1961, when my left family member 
left. Under American law, the property rights that were taken at the point of a gun from my family cannot be abrogated and the embargo cannot be lifted until those property rights are settled under negotiation. That's standing American law. America has a great deal of chips. My family was lucky. They got to leave a repressing police state, and they all came out safely. But they lost all their wealth. They lost the product of 60 years of labor. We're buried in cemeteries there. My family started the original Jewish community there. Our heart is there. And our property is in league with the human rights that you speak of because these settlements can occur until the repression in Cuba stops. It's a huge human rights problem. Robert Siegel, about a month ago, had on his show a professor from UCSD in California, a Brookings person, who had recently had lunch with the Chinese ambassador in his home in Cuba. It's my grandmother's home. Mm -hmm. Robert Siegel and the professor laughed about the fact that the family will never see it again. We probably won't. And that's not nearly as important as freeing the people of Cuba from the repression they live under. But it is one of the things, quite frankly, that's a bargaining chip that the US has and leverage it has to ensure the freedom of the Cuban people. So my heart's with you, Mauricio. I appreciate it. Can I, can I say something about that? Can I say Please. something about that? It's really interesting. You know, I, here's something that else that bothers me about the policy and what you know, we seek in this regards uh, with a lot of the commerce and things of the sort. Essentially what this policy seeks to do is to say, hey, I stole your car and now I'm going to lease it back to you and you're going to be okay with it. That's wrong. That's wrong, and I think we, and, and that's something that, that we need to that we need to that we need to be conscious of. Look, it's not saying property is not, not first and foremost issue in this regards, but there needs to. It, it is the largest confiscation of American property in in history. You know that that's a, that's also a big difference here, and that issue does need to be dealt with, particularly before we allow our other businesses and travelers and tourism, et cetera, to begin trafficking in that property. And, and, and Mauricio, the last thing my uncle did when he left Cuba was pay his employees. The first thing my family did when the Castros came in, because Batista left, and nobody loved Batista. I mean, there's this fiction about, you know, this great love that some people had. Nobody loved him. The first thing the, the new administration did was they called in leaders of the Cuban business community, and they said, our treasury is bankrupt because Batista took whatever was left. And they asked for prepayment of taxes which my family did. And the next thing they did was expropriate the property. And the next thing they did at the point of a gun was have a sleeve. So I'm with you, Mauricio. Mm -hmm. So, so, so talk, I mean, talk it is- Talk about how this administration is dealing with that. Well, yes, I mean, because it, in the United States, government has not given up on the issue of claims. Uh, I mean, the claims are still outstanding. Uh, $1.7 billion of property that was nationalized 1959, 60, 61 with interest now that amounts to about seven billion dollars and it's in fact one of the working groups of diplomats that the two sides are convening is precisely to talk about the issue of claims. Now the Cubans have counterclaims and so there's going to be a negotiation about it just as there always is in these kinds of situations. Guantanamo was paid for during the war of freedom. No, <laughs> no, 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 yeah, Let, let's right. be clear. Guantanamo even the United States recognizes in the Treaty of 1934 that Guantanamo is sovereign Cuban territory. We I understand lease, that. We lease it for $4,085 a year, which we've been paying diligently every year. And the, and the Cubans don't cash the checks. Castro used to put them in a drawer and show them to visitors who came to when his office. the office. Chinese ambassador pays rent on my grandmother's house, maybe he should start cashing those checks. <laughs> <laughs> but, the point, so, but the point is that the claims issue is not off the table. And not only the claims for uh, U.S. property that was nationalized, but there's the bigger, in, in terms of amounts, of the claims of Cuban Americans. That is a, diff a more difficult issue because while the Cuban government recognizes the legitimacy of U.S. claims, 
It does not recognize the legitimacy of Cuban American claims because they were Cuban citizens at the time. So working through the claims issue is going to be long, it's going to be difficult, but it's not something that the administration has by any means thrown in the towel. I'm surprised though because I, you never hear, you know, I went to, with Kerry down to Havana and he doesn't raise that issue publicly, whereas the Cubans always raise publicly their demands that they be compensated for the embargo. Uh, they do, um, and I think that's because they know that the claims negotiation is coming and they're staking out their position. But, but this is not an issue of the 50s and 60s. I mean, granted, in regards to Americans, because Americans aren't doing business, but, but to this day, you know, just a couple of years ago, you know, some of the most prosperous uh, partners of the regime, Canadians, Europeans, etc., have been all of a sudden arrested for quote-unquote corruption and then have money and were put in prison with no charge, et cetera, and what it was, their businesses were all confiscated. The Cuban regime is confiscating businesses to this day of Canadians, of Europeans, Chileans, uh, there's a Panamanian, there's, I mean, so, so this is not ancient history, and, but, but very important, because I just, I can't, I mean, I think it's so to the key of this all, you know, something the professor mentioned, which I, I just really want to, want to, want to clarify here, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the transition to the newer generation, look, just last week, the Minister of the Interior, uh, Abelardo Colomé Ibarra, uh, General Abelardo Colomé Ibarra, uh, res resigned for health reasons. He was 76 year old. His replacement was 77 year old uh, General Carlos Fernández Gondín, who is a, a brutal guy. They call him actually in Cuba the fairy godmother because he likes to make turn people into numbers and, and make them national security issues. He's also the one who's held, uh, managed the security forces in Venezuela. So I don't see that in regards. Now, yes, there is this individual, Miguel Díaz Canel. They, in Cuba, Miguel Díaz Canel, and by the way, I've never known once in history that Castro's actually abided by even his own constitution, but let's okay, let's, let's, let's say that is the fact. Um, um, uh, Díaz Canel in Cuba, they call him La Cuchara. Uh, which means the spoon. And I don't know if this joke will, I mean, if this goes in, in English, it'll make sense. But the reason they call him the spoon is because ni pincha ni corta. Because, in other words, he neither stabs nor cuts. In other words, he's useless. He's the spoon. He's just like a face. Uh, but he's, but, he's, but, he's, but it's, it's, a, it's a puppet figure. Just like before him, if we would have had this panel 10 years ago, they would have been talking about Carlos Laje and Felipe Perez Roque, who was the foreign minister and then the vice president constitutionally at that time and the, the successor. And what happened to them? Overnight they got purged. Nobody's heard from them since. Uh, and these were in the Wall Street Journal and all the newspapers, the next generation, the new generation. And guess where they were at? They were put in prison, then they were put in the plan pijama, which is essentially you get retired and you get sent out to this little town and you get to you know, pick weeds um, and, and things of the sort. Now Diaz Canel is the newest uh, member of that until he becomes part of the plan pijama. Um, but you know, anyway, but I think that's there's important. There's the actuarial tables guarantee there's going to be a transition to a new generation. That's right. Just hopefully not to the Castro family. Well, let's hope not, but here we go. Jim Frank from Chicago. So I don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, I'm not emotionally involved. And obviously, a lot of people have some pretty strong feelings. <laughs> so could you, from a high level, explain why somebody from the Midwest should really care about any of this? Uh, it's an island in the Caribbean. OK, so what? If you were talking about Venezuela, I understand. You know, got more oil than anybody in the Western Hemisphere. But why is there so much emotion, so much energy, so much focus on Cuba? I don't understand the impact to a non-emotionally involved American about this whole conversation. So you, you grow wheat question. out there in the Midwest? Pardon me? You grow wheat out there in the Midwest? We do. Cubans buy it. Yeah, how many? I mean, well, I mean, we're talking about, for example, you talked about $1.7 billion in claims, right? I mean, it's. It's a rounding error. Nobody cares about $1.7 billion. How big, how big is the market in Cuba? How much of a difference does it really make well, I mean, all I compared can tell to you, alternatives? All, I can, that we all have. I can tell you is that Cargill is leading the U.S. Agricultural yeah. Coalition to lift the embargo against Cuba. How big a market? And that, should be, and that should be very comforting that, you know, essentially Cargill is essentially leading our foreign policy towards Cuba. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't, I mean, I think that, you know, look, they, they're, they have one interest, which is making a profit. That's great. I'm all for that. But that shouldn't be the guiding light of, of our foreign policy in that regard, that so there's other considerations. <laughs> the, point, the point is that, in fact, the United States has interests in Cuba. We're not 
making unilateral concessions to the Cuban regime. There are advantages to the United States by changing a policy which, as I said, for, I mean, the president made the best argument. We had the same policy for 54 years and it hasn't produced any positive change. It, if anything, it managed to isolate us in the international community as the United Nations vote recently in the earlier summits of the Americas showed. So it's really a policy past its expiration date. So my fiance and I are going to Cuba next week. And I've been really surprised at some of the things that I've learned in our briefing sessions with this organization that's taking us. Um, one of the things they asked us not to do was not to bring money because something Americans have created when they visit is a culture of begging, which doesn't really exist there because we've been told that pretty much everybody eats and everybody has a roof over their head. And their literacy rates are much higher than ours. So my question is, is this a completely black and white issue or is there some gray here? Are there areas that the Cuban government has done better than we have? So, um, I mean, there is inequality in Cuba and there is poverty in Cuba. It's a poor country. And if you go to certain you know, parts of the city of Havana, you will see it. Um, I could think of, off the top of my head, I could do two things where I think the Cuban government policies could teach the United States something. One is in disaster preparedness and preparing for hurricanes and the ability to mobilize communities to safeguard themselves against, against hurricanes. Um, the other actually is preventive medicine. Uh, because Cuba is poor uh, and yet has universal health care, they tried to get the biggest bang for their buck by focusing on preventive care rather than sort of high-end technical care like we have here in the United States. And I think, you know, for a country like ours where health care costs have been spiraling out of control, you know, that would be an interesting strategy to look at. But in terms of the overall Cuban model, nobody looks at, at, at the Cuban economic model these days as, as a model to pursue because it hasn't been successful. I mean, the rate of economic growth in Cuba is really low. That's why the Cuban government itself is trying to change the economic model and open it up more uh, to market incentives. Um, and, you know, uh, I hope that they're going to be successful at that because I would like to see the Cuban economy grow so that the standard of living of the Cuban people can increase. And I think that will lead down the road to, to political change. I don't think it's something that happens overnight. Uh, just because the United States is, is trying to improve the relationship, you're not going to turn Cuba into a democracy overnight. But as I say, the policy of hostility didn't turn Cuba into a democracy in 50 years. Can, can I ask you, because I think that's such, that's imp such an important point, because uh, you hear a lot about, well, yeah, the Cuban regime is not good, but hey, look, free health care and free education. Um, I always like to say, you know, look, for, first and foremost, Cuban healthcare and education was always fairly advanced uh, and things of the sort. Now, obviously, it's not transparent, so we don't really know what the actual real numbers and things of the sort are because the, the regime manipulates that. But, you know, you have free healthcare in Scandinavia, uh, and, and they're not totalitarian dictatorships. Uh, so I, I don't think that that is necessarily a, a litmus uh, for, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather follow the Scandinavian model uh, than follow the Cuban model in that regards. You don't have to be a brutal dictator in order to have free healthcare and education. And also, you know, a lot of, a lot of nefarious uh, other entities, you know, like to use that whole uh, concept of free healthcare and education. You know, look, the Medellin cartel used to provide great healthcare and education in Medellin. Medellin people, people in Medellin used to love Pablo Escobar because they provided healthcare and had these clinics. Hamas provides clinics and provides, and I don't think neither Medellin cartel or Hamas are particularly uh, palatable folks, uh, but yet they provide uh, great healthcare and education to people, and they create a following in that regard. So I always like to say that that's not that's not that shouldn't be uh, an excuse for a brutal totalitarian regime. Anything she should look out for when she goes? I mean, it's, it seems to me that it's more of a cash economy and she should bring cash out of this thing. <laughs> Buy some art or um, do something. <laughs> Buy, support leave some good, local. Leave good tips in the hotel. What was that? She should leave her big diamond at home. Leave the big diamond at home <laughs> here. <laughs> Is there anybody else who has any questions? Yeah. I don't know how we're doing on time. So I'm. I'm Miriam Mascarellas, and I'm a foundation trustee from Los Angeles, and I'm Cuban-American. And I, um, I think the question that was asked, but I did not hear an answer as to why we should care, is a really important one. I care a great deal because I came to this country as a toddler, 
and I still have family there, and I can tell you that they are there. It's a family of medical doctors, and the youngest just left Cuba because he gets paid twenty dollars equivalent U.S. a month. Everything is rationed. If we didn't send money every month and goods, they would live in a state of poverty like street people live in many parts of our country. So he just recently moved to Angola to practice medicine. I mean, what does that say? Uh, so clearly, I'm personally in invested in the issue, but I think that we should care. And one of the reasons that we care is the large amount of Cuban Americans in the US who came here with oftentimes nothing and have become very successful. I mean, there are two men that are running for president in the Republican Party who have Cuban roots. What does that say? I think that speaks volumes. Um, so I, I, I'd like to hear more about, and I think this group is a, is a great audience for it, of the just a few factors of why we should care and be personally vested. Sure. So I think there are uh, a number of good reasons. Um, one is because, you know, historically Cuba and the United States have actually been so close with one another. From, you know, all the way back to the middle of the 19th century, there's been extraordinary social connections between Cuba and, and the United States. Um, from a, you know, sort of higher level, sort of high politics point of view, Cuba is a, is a nearby neighbor. And so there are lots of transnational issues that we can only effectively deal with in cooperation with Cuba, whether it's safeguarding the maritime environment in the Caribbean, protecting against oil spills or mitigating them if they happen, uh, preventing the transmission of infectious disease through the region, uh, the whole issue of migration, of course, um, interdicting narcotics trafficking coming through the Caribbean, and on and on and on and on. When, when Secretary Kerry was in Havana reopening the embassy, uh, and he gave the press conference with Foreign Minister Rodriguez, he actually went through a long, long, long list of issues of mutual interest um, where the United States has a stake in, in having a, a relationship with Cuba. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, uh, I think anybody who's ever been there uh, comes away with a, a degree of affection for, for Cuba and, and for Cubans. Uh, and I can tell you that Cubans have a strong degree of affection for Americans. So uh, they're a close neighbor. They're a neighbor that uh, you know, could, could use our assistance and in which we have a stake in terms of, of how, their, how their future turns out. You know, I think the differences Mauricio and I have is you know, how do we get to a place where Cuba and the United States can have a more normal, friendly relationship and Cubans can have a freer economy and a freer political system as well. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing to give the president's policy a shot over the next few years because the old policy didn't work. Right. And the final word goes so, to Mauricio. So, I mean, I, I think we should care about Cuba a great deal for, for, for various reasons, and I'll kind of segue into what the professor has said. You know, so for, obviously there's a humanitarian reason, and there's a humanitarian reason that right 90 miles from, from, from our shores there's people that strive to be free and are denied that, that, that freedom uh, per se. I think looking at the future, I think it's very important in the sense that this is a country that could be our greatest ally in the Western Hemisphere, uh, particularly because we have stood by their side in the darkest of times. It's fascinating, so all, every, and those of you who have been to Cuba, they love Americans. I always ask people, why do they love Americans? If the Castro regime is telling them 24 hours a day that we are the reason that for all their ills and we're the bad guys and they are embargo and we're the devil, yet why do they love Americans? For the same reason Eastern Europeans love Americans and for the same reason that, that, that they, they, they follow us wherever we go because there is this knee-jerk reaction that we are the antithesis of that regime. We don't want to become Canadians in Cuba. That's what the president's policy can do to us. We don't want to become the French in Cuba. We don't want to become Italians in Cuba. The Cuban people love us for a reason. We stand for something different. We shouldn't lower our standards in order to do so. And by the way, why couldn't they be our greatest allies? Because in the same way as, as Eastern Europe, but let's not forget, this regime that somehow now we think are gonna be closet Democrats and are gonna become better, throughout history have always worked against our interests. Read Khrushchev's memoirs. These, Castro was willing to kill 2.5 million Americans uh, and ask them to pull the trigger. That's, that's important. They've been the, they were the Soviet proxies in, in, in Africa, in here, etc. Okay, hey Mauricio, don't go back to that ancient history. Yeah, he wanted to kill 3 million Americans, but we forgive him now. Uh, it's okay. Um, but let's look to 
today, Venezuela. You know, that, did, that didn't happen. That When everyone was saying that Cuba wasn't a threat and Cuba was an issue and all, all these Cubans, they exaggerate about the Cuban intelligence apparatus and all these things. Well, welcome to Venezuela, the most resource-rich country in the Western Hemisphere under Cuban control today and, 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 and its democratic institutions falling apart. Well, welcome all the Russian spy ships that the reason why they can go up and down our eastern seaboard and they do so well is because they're being welcomed in the Cuban docks. They don't have these, th that regime doesn't have that goodwill towards us, but the Cuban people do. So I, I, I close by saying, Let's not be Canadians. Let's be Americans. <laughs> we have great principles, and that's why the Cuban people love us, and that's why we should continue to have that principled policy. I want to thank you all very much for coming out to this very lively debate. <laughs> and thanks for the great questions.